Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody's faces again. I've been out for a couple weeks. <laughs> um, hope everything's going well. Um, let, why don't you rise and join me, join with me in the call to worship. Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without weight wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now let us sing our songs of ascent, I guess, of coming toward God in, in song. Jesus the Nazarene, and 
seated. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. I thank you for this time to come and gather and remember your work on the cross. Um, remember that we are loved and cared for. Um, remember that um, we have an infinite joy before us. Um, Lord, I pray that you would bless this time um, to worship you. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, welcome. Um, welcome to, uh, I guess what's the second Sunday in July, like midsummer, but it's been raining like it's springtime, right? New England summer, New England summer. New England summer. Um, this is our time. Uh, just want to welcome you guys here. I'm glad to see everybody's faces. Um, and uh, I'm glad to see everyone who's online welcome as well. As we come before God, we have a time where we... Um, we realize that we are very inadequate before a perfect God. And this is the time where we come and we confess our sins and the confidence that we are forgiven for them through the blood of Christ. Um, so what we'll have now is the time of confession of sin, which will be uh, read responsively this time. Um, and then we'll have a time for personal reflection. And then we'll have the words of assurance. So join with me. Um, and during the during the quiet time, you may alter your posture in some way, kneel, bow your head, whatever it may be. Our lips are ready to confess, but our hearts are slow to feel, our wills reluctant to repent. We bring our entire selves to you this morning. Bend us, wound us, and if necessary, break us. We have seen the purity of your perfect word, the happiness of those whose heart it reigns, and the calm dignity of the walk to which it calls. Yet, Yet we daily violate its, its precepts. Your loving spirit strives within us, brings us scripture warnings, speaks in startling providences, allures by secret whispers. Yet we make shameful choices that grieve him and quench his influence. We mourn and lament these sins, crying to you for pardon. Grant that through the tears of repentance, we may see more clearly the goodness and glory of our Savior, 
and his cross. Now you may alter your posture in some way for a time of private confession. Now rise, you who are forgiven, and hear these words of assurance. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Because the shepherd has laid down his life for your sin, we have access to his abundant life. To those who repent and look to Jesus for their salvation, the absolution of sins is effected in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Forgive me just one second here. I love this, that we might have life abundantly. Mm. I look so often towards everything else, you know, a home, a happiness, money, whatever it is, food, but that is not the abundant life. Mm. The abundant life is simply knowing our Savior. Now it's a time for tithes and offerings. Um, this is a time where we give back what God has given to us. Um, and we do so with a song. So if you join us in singing, um, you may make drop off checks outside, mail them to our address, or bring them up front. Um, thank you. is 
death and resurrection why should i gain from his reward i cannot give an answer but this i know with all my heart his wounds have paid my Please join with me in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our text this morning comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll, I'll see she gets justice so she won't eventually come back and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning again. We're continuing on the series of the, some of the parables of Christ. And this is the parable of the persistent widow. And as always, when we look at a parable, one of the things we want to do is find out the reason why the parable was spoken, the target audience of the parable, and then lastly, what I need for you to do is to see if you can identify or, you know, identify yourself in the parable. You know, see if there's someone in that parable that you can you know, associate yourself with. Stories told of a fisherman who did an experiment with some fish. He caught a large black bass. And instead of putting it in the freezer or maybe in the frying pan, he actually put it in a glass tank filled with water. Each morning, this fisherman would bring a minnow. A minnow is a small fish, very, very small fish. And he would put the minnow in the tank and, you know, you just drop the minnow in the tank. The larger fish, the bass, would make a dash for the minnow and soon would finish him off for breakfast or brunch or lunch. <laughs> After a number of days of this, the fisherman actually placed a glass partition right in the middle of the tank. And then after he did that, he dropped the minnow in the side where the 
opposite to the bass. So he dropped the minnow in the side where that was empty and not the side where the bass was. The big fish made his usual lunge, but of course bumped his face into the glass. I, I, I digress here. I was in the supermarket recently, and you know those cash registers, they have the, the glass part, they still have the glass partitions, and then the cashiers, they actually have a, I didn't even realize that, they have a glass thing that's to the side also, and, and the, <laughs> the cashier turned and she walked right into the glass partition, <laughs> and, and she turned around. She, I, I laughed. And, 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 and I just said to her, I said, you remind me of some of those birds that just crash right into a, you know, a window and just crash and just fall. And, 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 and the person who was bagging says, don't you hate that? Don't you hate that? That, that happens to me all the time. And, I, and then to make her not feel that bad, I said, well, when, I, when the pandemic started and I was, you know, as a teacher, I said, I'm a teacher, and so we had the option of wearing a, you know, a face, uh, a face mask, or we had, you know, the, the um, it's like a, a plastic shield. I said, you would not, you would not believe the amount of times my eye is itching me, and I go to. <laughs> I go to wipe my eye or just touch my eye, and I, my hand is hitting the shield. And um, what was, you know, I, I said, yeah, you know, right now it's just me and this, and your bagger, you know, the person who's bagging saw you. I said, yeah, I did it in front of a whole classroom of kids. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. So the big fish made his usual lunch to but bumped his nose on the glass. But he did not give up so easily. He kept ramming the glass over and over and over again. And every time he went after the minnow on the other side of the glass partition, he would just be hitting himself. And finally, the blows were <laughs> just too much. And the bass fish just Cease, just stop trying. After a number of days of this separation, with the glass separating the two, the fisherman tried something. He removed the separation. He removed the glass separation. And to his surprise, the minnow and the bass <laughs> swam freely together. The minnow was now available for food, but the bass made no attempt to get it. <laughs> Frustration had conditioned it to accept failure, and it just gave up. <laughs> Frustration had conditioned it to accept failure, and it just gave up. Don't you think the same thing can happen to us? And the question is, why do some people fail? Because they come to a point where they just simply stop. Like the bass, they get their nose bumped against the obstacle, obstacle so often that they just quit. They give up. They lose heart. And do not have the courage to go on trying. This is a primary cause for the high casualty rate in the battle of light against darkness. Prayer, you see, is a basic weapon in this battle. And believers are often disappointed in prayer at some time. You've prayed, and I know, I know you've been there. I've been there. Prayed and prayed, and it seems to do no good. And so you begin to wonder what is the use of it. Some even conclude that it's no use at all. And so like the bass, conditioned by frustration, 
You let your disappointment bring you to a state where you do no longer try. See, Jesus knew that this could happen even to his own disciples. And that is why he sought to prepare them for what was coming. He had just been telling them about the trials ahead for himself and the judgment to come. He told of the indifference of the people on the day of Noah and again in Sodom before its destruction. He said that history will repeat itself and God's judgment will again fall on man. Meanwhile, life for his followers will not be a bed of roses. This was not the most encouraging time to be a disciple of Christ, if you look at it from a human perspective, because he seemed to be preaching doom. But that is why he told them this parable. As with other parables, Jesus clarified the purpose for the parable, and his targeted audience was also made crystal clear. There was no mystery at all to it. This was a parable for his disciples to teach them a simple principle of perseverance. It was told so that his disciples should keep on praying and never lose heart. It is told to prevent Christians from becoming discouraged and giving up on prayer. Jesus would not bother to tell such a parable and have it recorded for all generations, even to us, if it did not deal with the very real and serious danger. Think about it. Those of us who are parents or in charge of children in some way at some time, you don't tell your children about the danger of playing with high-level nuclear radiation. I, I, I've never warned my, my, my boys about, you know, don't play, don't play with, uh, don't play with high-level nuclear radiation items. Probably because you know that they're not going to be playing with any such item. But you do warn them about the danger of fire. Amen? Yeah. Because you know it's very likely they will have an opportunity at some point, hopefully in the distant future, but almost always in the near future, that they're going to have an opportunity to play with fire. So also Jesus does not waste inspiration on the impossible or the improbable but deals only with the probable, the likely, and sometimes even the certain. Yeah, he knows this is going to be our experience, and we are going to be challenged to persevere. He knows that prayer will often seem like a fruitless weapon on the battlefield of life, and that his disciples may often feel like relegating it to the museum of religious relics, and seek some other way or method of combating the enemy. And that would be a huge mistake. He knew this, and that is why he told this parable. He wanted to stir, up, stir them up to press on and not to lose heart, to stick to their guns and persist in prayer at all times and under all circumstances. This is the stated purpose of the parable. How then does Jesus accomplish this? He does so by following a very effective method of teaching involving three steps. One, he gives a contemporary illustration. Two, he showed them a clear application. And thirdly, lastly, he gave them a challenging question. Contemporary illustration. In verse 2, Jesus draws a verbal picture of a typical situation in his day, which is actually not really different from what we have today. Here was a public servant who had to be pressured into doing any service to the public. 
<laughs> Come on now. If you think about it, things have not changed very much. A public servant who had to be pressured into doing a service to the public. This judge was self-sufficient. He was a self-sufficient intellectual who neither feared God nor regarded man. I can think of a few, few people like that. Basically, he was involved in what you call practical atheism. It's nothing new. Jesus saw plenty of that in his day. He had no superficial view of this man's nature. Jesus knew exactly who this man was, and he painted the picture proper, proper, accurately. He recognized the reality of depravity and the existence of godless men in high places. And today it's no different. We still have godless men in high places. Here was a man whose duty it was to administer justice. But he had no morals. He had no scruples. He had no absolutes. For he feared not the God of justice. And he had no deep concern for the rights of men. He was motivated by neither conviction nor compassion. But only by his own pleasure. He is the last person to go to for mercy and the last person who would go out of his way to help this poor widow. Now understand that Jesus is purposely portraying a pessimistic picture. <laughs> He's purposely portraying that pessimistic picture to try and match the feelings that overwhelm a person in a very unfavorable situation when they desperately need help. <coughs> Sorry, this widow had reached her rock bottom. She pretty much had nowhere else to go. A story involving a good judge. Think about it. If Jesus had told a story about a good judge, that story wouldn't have made the point. It would have been a worthless story. It would not bring across the point. If the man was a good judge, there would be no problem. But Jesus wanted a situation with a problem. He wanted a situation where the woman was frustrated. He wanted a situation where the woman was desperate because he knew that there would come a time when his disciples were going to be desperate. And he knew there was going to come a time when you and I are going to face a desperate situation. Amen. He wanted to portray a setting in life with a great obstacle to overcome, to compare with what his disciples were going to face. Some are bothered by the fact that Jesus would use, and, and, and let, let, me, let me say this now. Because in the parable of the prodigal son, I remember I changed, uh, you, uh, you know, the, 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 the name of the parable, you know, was changed from the parable of the prodigal son to the parable of the good father. You remember that? Parable of the good father. Because God was depicted as the father who welcomed his son and, uh, and just forgave his son and welcomed him in, in and had a party for this son and, and, and brought him back to the status of being a son. But in this parable, God is this evil judge. On, on face value, that doesn't make any sense. And some are bothered by the fact that Jesus would use such a godless man to illustrate a godly truth <coughs> and make him stand in parallel with God the Father. But Jesus was not comparing the man with God the Father. In fact, he was not comparing but he was contrasting the two. There is no problem. 
when we see that the contrast of this judge and God is one of the main emphasis that Jesus was bringing out. Jesus' rhetorical question points to this. In verse 6 and 7, Jesus says, Listen to the words of the unjust judge. Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him all day and night? It's a kind of rhetorical question. If this judge did this for this widow, if this unjust judge, if this evil man who doesn't have any regards for man or for God, if this man gave this woman because of her persistency, gave her, you know, um, her just due, says, will not God? So he wasn't saying that this judge man was, was parallel to God. He was contrasting and saying if this man would, would do this, come on, think about it. Would not God? Not an evil judge, but would not God, your loving heavenly father, would not God, whose love according to Jeremiah is everlasting, would not God, who the Apostle John says, Oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And that is who we are. Would not God? Amen? Would not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? In verse 3, Jesus introduces the persistent woman who kept coming to this villain of a judge, asking him to protect her rights and do her justice against her adversary. She's not looking for revenge. She's only looking for justice. This had to be a serious problem for centuries, actually in terms of widows being taken advantage of. A widow was at the mercy of those who would take advantage of her impotent social and legal status. And they would often try to take her possessions or property from her. And even the Pharisees were involved in schemes to rid widows of their rightful ownership. This widow needed professional help, or she would sink. And here was this widow who was not going to tolerate injustice, but she came time and time again. She came time and time again. She came and she came and she came. Dismissal after dismissal, denial after denial, she kept on coming and demanded that her rights be protected. In verse 4, the scripture says that the judge is not impressed with her enthusiasm and he refused to help her, even after her coming time and time again. But the woman is equally unimpressed with his refusal and she persistently pleads with him to help her. Her persistence compels him to reconsider. And verses 4 and 5 tells us how he reasoned within himself. Watch this. In his mind, he first protects himself from the charge of being soft or even being religious. Because he affirms his indifference to God and man. Even though I don't regard God I don't regard man. So, you know, he, he's rationalizing within himself because he has to protect himself and his reputation of himself of being this, 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 this goon of a man. He affirms his indifference. Then he's consciously, and de that he's consciously and deliberately godless. And he glories in it. 
He doesn't want anyone to get the impression that if he does good, that it's because he has any principles of human rights or equality before God or man. A self-centered man needs no reason for his actions outside of himself. And that is what we see. He's getting tired of hearing her. So he decides the best way of getting rid of her pestering is to help her out. Nagging. Nagging is considered not a virtue. But one thing you can say about nagging, it often gets the job done. <laughs> One thing you can say about nagging, it often gets the job done, as it did in this case. She gave this judge a clear impression that she would not cease until she got some results. A few years ago, I went back to Jamaica after a long time, had not been to Kingston, Jamaica, and Kingston is a large city, large city. It's got well over a million people in population. It's, it's as big or bigger than the city of Boston. And growing up in the city, I didn't realize how much I had gone away from being accustomed to city noise. And it was a Friday night, and there was a block party that was just two houses down. They had speakers as tall as me. And they had speakers on top of that speaker. <laughs> When that reggae music started and the bass started thumping, my window started rattling. I could not sleep. I had forgotten. I had become, you know, spoiled. I had become unaccustomed to the city noise. Because growing up, didn't matter. That's what I was accustomed to. That's what you, you know, you go to sleep, windows rattling, you know, you know you're sleep time, you're going to sleep. I said, Carlene, to my big sister, I said, Carlene, how can you sleep? How can you and mom sleep with this? I, I had forgotten. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call the police. Ah, it's not going to do any good. <laughs> I said, I, yeah, I'm going to call the police. So I looked up the halfway tree. That's the, you know, the, 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 the station. Ha yeah, it's halfway tree, believe it or not. That's the name of the community. I looked up the halfway tree police station in the, in, in the telephone, and I called them up. Told them the situation. And they said, thank you, we'll take care of it. I waited two, three, four minutes, five minutes, nothing. Ten minutes, nothing. I called them again. I said, I called you guys ten minutes ago about the situation. They said, yeah, we have it, we have it on, on record. I said, yeah, but what's being done about it? They said, oh, yeah, we, we're going to send a, a cruiser over, you know, to take care of it. Waited, you know, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, nothing. My sister looked at me and says, Tony, you're wasting your time. They're not going to do anything. I said, I can't sleep. I said, I'm going to call them. Call them again. So I called them again. And they said, yes, we know. We're, we're, we're calling a, you know, you know we, we, we've uh, sent the message to, to, to a cruiser. We've informed them, and they're going to take care of it. I said, yeah, it needs to be taken care of now. So 
So I went out to the gate and I looked down and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a street, it's a whole, it's, it was a house there. So we're, we're the second house from the corner and the, and the block party was being held um, at the house that was on the other street but facing our street. So I could look and sure enough there was a cruiser there and there was uh, you know, a couple of police guys, you know, sorry. There were a couple of police guys, and you know, one had one one had gotten something from from the you know you know the party people, and one had something in his hand and drinking. Not going to say what it was. Could have been, yeah. <laughs> and I said, "This is ridiculous." So I went back inside and I called again. I said, "Listen, the police is there, but the noise is still." I said, "No, we got it." I said, "I can't sleep. It's ridiculous." So about two minutes after that, the decimal level went down. The noise level went down. Bearable. My chest was still thumping from the base, but my windows were not. <laughs> I said, I can sleep with that. I went into, the, went into my bed, got under my covers, <laughs> Music, volume went all the way right back up. I called them, I told them exactly what had happened. And then I said this, I will be calling you every two minutes until this ends. Twenty-four calls I made. Every two minutes, every two minutes, 24 calls I made. Yeah, I counted. Why are you calling? I said, I'm calling because I have a complaint and nothing has been done. Called again. Yes, you just called. I said, yes, and nothing has been done. And, I'll, and, I, and I said, and I, you, you, you are, you, you are, uh, you, they said you're, you might be blocking the line of, of, of you know, of, of, of somebody with a real emergency. I said, I can't sleep. This is my emergency. I said, I will call and call and call every two minutes. You will know it's me. And when the volume finally went down, it stayed down. Persistency. Sometimes the desperation got to leave you at such a level that you will be persistent until there is an answer. Amen. Until there is an answer. And that's the persistency that Christ was asking of his disciples. That he was saying, you don't know what you're going to face. But I'm telling you, what you will face will demand of you a persistency in prayer. Until you get the answer from God. Hmm. This guy, this, this judge, didn't care about her rights at all. But he did care about his own nervous system. <laughs> and so he took her case. The illustration comes to a happy ending with the assumption that the widow was vindicated. And she was. But we also see that Jesus used a clear application. In verse 6, Jesus says to listen to, that, to what that unjust judge said. Here's an evil man who cares not for God's plan or for man's rights. And yet he helps out this widow. 
and does her justice because he wa she was persistent in her pleading. He was a godless man compelled to do God's will because of a persistent request. Let me say it again. He was a godless man who was compelled to do God's will because of a persistent request of this widow. This is a truth we do not often consider. We sometimes complain about public servants. We might do well to follow the wisdom of this widow and begin to put pressure on these public servants to do what is right and what is just. Even a corrupt public servant will work for what is just if the public persistently demands it. If they do not, it's because people are indifferent and these, this leaves the public servants to do freely as they please. Word to the wise. This unjust judge was not going to be going around looking for needy people for help. <laughs> no, he wasn't doing that. And we ought not to expect that such a man would. We ought not to expect, expect any godless servant to be concerned about justice. Such persons only do justice when it is to their own advantage. And it, is, it might be our duty to make it advantageous to them if they do what is right. Now, this is not what Jesus was getting at, but it's a side point that I think needs to be made. Bad men will do good if good people demand it. Bad men and women will do good if good people demand it. Jesus makes the application of the parable to the subject of persistence in prayer and says, in effect, if even a godless judge will finally yield out of selfish motives to a persistent request of this widow for justice, can you question for a moment that God, the author of all justice and father of all mercies, will not do justice for all of his elect who persist in crying to him day and night? If a person like that will even do justice, it is absolute certainty that God will. Life shows us that persistent persistence works in many realms. Jesus says that the elect cry day and night, and like the widow, they're not answered immediately. God delays, as did the judge in this parable, but for different reasons. In the parable, the judge delayed answering because of his hard-heartedness, because he didn't care for God or for anybody or for, you know, anyone. So he, 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 he delayed out of self-centeredness and selfishness. God's delay is for a different reason. God lets injustice and oppression of his own continue even after they plea for justice. It is because of his long suffering and not because of his indifference and lack of concern. He is not slack concerning his promise, the word of God tells us, but is long suffering and not willing that any should perish. He will vindicate his elect and all injustice will be judged. No evil will go unpunished. But the delay is due to the fact that God's plan includes mercy even for those who are the oppressors. Jesus did not teach us to pray for our enemies and then turn around and say, you know, um, you know, you know God, we're going to seek vengeance and seek it right now. He says, pray for your enemies. Do good to them that use you. Vengeance is mine, 
says the Lord. Why? Because he is long-suffering. If God did not show patience and, and bear with those who oppress his people, think about it. We read the book of Romans. Yes? We read the book of 1 Corinthians. Amen? We read the book of 2 Corinthians. We read the book of Ephesians, of Galatians. Amen? We read the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. We read the book of Titus. We would not have any of those books if God was not long-suffering. Because Saul was an enemy of the church. He was an oppressor. But God delayed answering the prayers of those Paul himself was oppressing because God was long-suffering towards the oppressor Saul himself. Think about that. Many of the elect through the ages would be riven in the flames of hell if God judged sinners immediately. And that includes you and me. One person says, better to never be born than to be born into a sinful world where God stands impatiently and ready to send judgment on every occasion of sin. Rome, in the days right after Christ, Rome martyred and persecuted the saints even longer before it fell. And many nations since then have persecuted believers, and God has not answered the prayers for help immediately. He delays because he operates also with eternity's value in view. His elect are already saved, and if they're killed, they lose only a few days of temporary life. But if their oppressors are killed, they lose eternity. The judge delayed because he did not care about God. He did not care about the widow. But God delays because he does care. He does care about those who are being persecuted. And he does care about the persecutors themselves. Persistence in prayer means that when God does not answer as we think he should, we should find a way of praying some consistency with his will. So we're telling God what to do and how to do it. Maybe we should say, God, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. George Washington Carver, African-American inventor, told of how he prayed for God to show him the meaning of the universe. He was baffled by this beautiful universe. And through scripture and the advice or counsel of some people, God, God started to, God gave him the, the sensation, the, 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 you know, the, the sense that, you know, George, you're asking the, the wrong question. And so George started to ask, show me the meaning of, if I, just not the world, but show me the meaning of smaller things that my mind could wrap around. And one of the things that God showed him the meaning of is peanuts. And if you don't know who George Washington Carver is, look it up. He invented so many usage of the peanut. It's almost ridiculous. He could use it for good. God heard that prayer and enabled him to discover many useful products for the peanut. 
Persistence means that you never give up, but keep approaching God from a new angle when a certain prayer is not answered. Praying is like any other area of life. If you do not persist in it, you will fail. If you only played tennis or any sport when, you, when you're great at it and gave up when you did poorly, you would soon find out you're going to quit all sports because sooner or later you are going to fail. And I, 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 I am amused every time I think about baseball. If a, you know, if, if a baseball batter bats you know, um, 350, he's considered uh, you know, a success. 350, that's 35% of the time he gets a hit. In other words, he fails more than he is successful. He's making a hit only 35 out of every 100 times he's at bat. And that player is considered a great batter, a great success. That's kind of weird in my mind. Think about it. Anything you start and you make a mistake on or you, you know, have a time of failure and you quit, you will soon give up on your hobby, give up on this, give up on that. You will soon give up on life. But you cannot give up when you think in your mind that it has not worked out. You have to persevere. You have to continue. We fail in prayer as we do in every other area of life. And we're often frustrated. But Jesus says that we are not to give up, but keep doing and keep learning. Persistence will make you a winner in the long run. Persistence is a necessary ingredient in our relationship with God, both because of our slowness to get where we need to be. We just don't get it sometimes. We are so slow to understand, and that's not really a mystery because God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So we just are so slow to sometimes understand what God is teaching us. He will knock at the door, but he really will break it down. And our prayers are sometimes, almost always, asking God to break down the doors. And that's not his style. Jesus is saying to his disciples that they should never stop praying for God to act. They should persist in prayer and never give up. For he will certainly answer in his time and according to his will. And judgment will come, but they ought not to let the delay lead to discouragement. If a widow persists with a man who has no concern, even for her, but she persisted? How much more should we not persist with a God who cares more for us than that unjust judge cared for this woman? And finally, Jesus asked a challenging question. Jesus is saying that the question is really not, will God triumph? Will he finally do justice and answer the prayer of his people? That's not really the question. But the question is, will his people persist in prayer, believe in this? When that day comes for his return to judge and be glorified in the saints, will there be any who have endured to the end, faithful and confident in God's plan? Or will men be defeated by the delays of God because God was merciful to others? And they simply just give up in despair, concluding that prayer is useless. A gloomy picture is painted for the end times. It will be likely that many will lose faith in prayer and cease to pray. Ungodliness will thrive and injustice will fill the earth. And only those who, are who with unshakable faith will persist in prayer, believing that God will still yet answer. Jesus does not answer the question. And the question is, will he find faith when he comes? He didn't answer that question. 
Because that question is for us to answer. That question is for each individual to answer. Will God find you faithful? Each of us will have to answer for ourselves. Each of us will have that question asked to us as individuals. Will God find you faithful? Notice in the story that the widow, throughout all her troubles, she did not seek alternative measures to attain justice for herself. She might have been tempted to take matters into her own hands. You know, you know seek out some dark underworld characters you know, and say, listen, I got some money put aside. Uh, could you cancel someone out for me, please? She didn't go to that extreme. She, you know, she, she, she didn't try to take things into her own hands. She was still putting it where it should have been, at the mercy of this judge. And when we have issues, when we have problems, when we have situations, it will do us best if we do not take things into our own hands. Amen. We leave it to God and leave it there. Take it to the altar and leave it there. As my pastor used to say, my pastor from years gone by, bring it to the altar, palms down, hands open. Palms down and hands open. Which means if you're like this, you cannot lift it, you cannot take it back up. Because sometimes some of us, we bring things to God, and when we get up from our knees, we also take what we bring to God, and we, we carry it with us. We don't leave it with God. God says, leave it with me. Amen. Leave it with me. That's a dark road if you try to take, take, it, take things into your own hands and control it. It's a dark road to go down, and this widow did not go there so in darkness will always reap darkness. She was not only persistent in her asking, but she was persistent with whom she was asking. That is, she was persistent in asking the only person who could genuinely help her. She was persistent in asking the judge. She didn't ask the judge, and then when the judge said no, she came back and maybe a, you know, a couple times she asked the judge, and the judge said no. She says, you know what, forget you. Let me go somewhere else. <laughs> if you pray and you ask God and, and, and there is not the answer that you are seeking, don't go elsewhere. Continue to pray for God because God is your source. God is your help. Amen. I look to the hills from when cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who makes heaven and earth. No, no other place. No other person. Be consistent. Be persistent. I was going to say the, the poem, but I decided not to. But I'll tell you the poem. It's a poem written by um, a seminary colleague of mine. And he, he, he recited this poem at a function. It took him, I would, I would guess it didn't take him long to write this poem. Because he was inspired. And after he started reading his poem, reciting his poem... After about 30 seconds, or maybe less than 30 seconds, people started to chuckle. People started to laugh. You see, the poem only had two words. Go on. These two words were repeated numerous times, over and over and over again. And yes, when we realized that that was the extent of his poem, we started laughing. Because <laughs> if, you, if you think about it, someone just saying two words, go on. Consistently, continually, it was comical. But he said those two words. He said it as a question. Then he said it as an answer. He said go on as a statement. 
He said it with an exclamation. He even said it with doubt and anxiety, even with fear, but ended the poem with an emphatic declaration, go on. I want you to look to the person next to you right now. Look to the person next to you and just tell them, go on. Amen. Because we have to be persistent, not only in our faith, in our, in our prayer life, but in our faith and walk with God. So I leave you with this. Go on. Go on. Anyone who was there to hear Macbeth's poem <laughs> would now be laughing at me that I'm using Macbeth poem to end my sermon. But the depth and seriousness of the poem is in the simplicity of its message. Go on. Let's look to God in prayer. What an immense impactful story of this unjust selfish judge and the persistency of this widow helpless without his help Replicating the fact that we are helpless without your help. And like the psalmist, Lord, we say, I, you know, I look to the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Help us to be faithful and to be persistent and not just asking, Lord, but persistent in whom we ask of. To be reassured and that you are indeed our source, our strength, our help in time of trouble, at all times. Give us the wisdom, dear God, to be cognizant of your will, of your mercy, the long-suffering nature that you pour out time and time again, that if we are honest with each other, if we are honest with ourselves, You would say like the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me, if judgment would come without the blood of Christ, I perish. Help us to understand your love. Help us not to give up when it seems like our prayers are not heard. But help us, dear God, that in our persistence we also gain wisdom. Wisdom of your will, your way. We pray, dear God, for the folks who suffered under this disaster of Hurricane Elsa. From the Southeast Caribbean all the way up 
to the Northern Caribbean, to Florida, and even along the Eastern seaboard. We pray, dear God, that you would first grant unto the first responders safety and strength, wisdom and sharpness of mind, we pray for the families of those who were killed in that destruction and collapse of the building in Florida. We pray, dear God, that this would be a time where they would seek you and find you. Find that you're a God of compassion the God of solace. Bring to pass, dear God, your scripture that says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We thank you, dear God, for your healing touch. Thank you for all situations. As we give ourselves over to you, there's some of us who are having difficulty in our, in, 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 you know, with family situations, children and grandchildren, siblings. And we commit ourselves and our loved ones to you. We do not forget to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory as we are asking this. In the name of Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 In the next couple of weeks, we will begin um, a long stretch of about eight weeks where we'll, we will be uh, having a luncheon after church. Amen? Good times. Good times. We'll be having a luncheon after church, and then after the luncheon, we come back into the sanctuary to watch an episode of uh, The Chosen. So it's going to be movie time, except, sorry, not going to allow any popcorn in the sanctuary. Get your popcorn, you know, eat it before, <laughs> all right? Um, and York peppermint patty is not allowed either. Yeah, that was for one particular person. Um, God is good, amen? Amen. amen? amen. And so thankful to have Jen here again, and she's going to lead us as we close with our song. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All right. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord. 
hearted prayer Can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer Are we weak and heavy laden Cumbered with the load of care Precious Savior, still our refuge Take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake thee take it to the lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee thou wilt find the solace there Amen. Stand with me. I just love it when Jen is here to play. <laughs> and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us all, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Folks, as you go through the week, as you walk with God, you should also run with God. Skip it. Oh.